the Veterans Breakfast Club Happy Hour for Monday, October 23rd. My name is Sean Hall. I'm the Director of Programming with the V. For those of you who are new to us, uh, our mission is to create communities of listening around veterans and their stories to connect, educate, heal, inspire. Uh, tonight, uh, probably a more solemn program. Uh, usually we do 90 minutes. Uh, usually it's 7 to 8.30. Tonight we feel like we have more than enough veterans in the room and stories in the room that we will probably go late. Uh, so just note that, that we may go till 9 o'clock tonight. And as I said, maybe a, a bit more solemn as, as we are honoring the 40th anniversary of the Beirut bombing. Hopefully most of you joined us last week. We had a very uh, extensive and wonderful uh, history lesson by Jim Lariviere. Did I get that correct correctly? Close? Okay. Um, as we had a, a wonderful history lesson last week, sort of setting the stage for everything that was going on in Beirut. This week, we're going to talk more specifically uh, about the bombing, um, remember those we lost, um, and hear and share stories. Uh, we also have several different announcements here at the top and a couple videos uh, to give you an idea of the program. I'm going to do my announcements here. And uh, then we have a trailer for a documentary upcoming by Michael Ivey, who joined us last week. He's doing the documentary called We Came in Peace. Uh, we will play that trailer. We'll introduce uh, the veterans that are joining us tonight, and uh, then we will play uh, a video. Uh, Ronald Reagan gave a speech uh, many years ago and used a letter written by Rabbi Reznikov, who is joining us tonight. Uh, that's about a 17-minute video, uh, but we were encouraged uh, to play that whole video because there's many veterans who haven't heard that speech. Um, we've cut it down to 17 minutes, but it's very powerful, and we, th we think everybody will enjoy it. Joining me as always, Todd DiPestino and Brad Washaba. They're my wingmen tonight. How are you hello, both doing? Hello. Uh, thank you both for being here. Uh, and thank you all for being here with us this evening. If you have questions during the program tonight, please put them in the chat. Please wave your hand. We'll be all watching the windows uh, and we'll be happy to answer questions as we go along. But we want to start with thanking our sponsor. As we usually do, we thank Tobacco Free Adagio Health for sponsoring the VBC. They are dedicated to reducing and preventing tobacco use and to getting the word out about the hazard of smoking and secondhand smoke. They are all about health, so they want people to quit. They have classes, nicotine replacement therapy, and a popular quit line, 1-800-QUIT-NOW. They also educate people, children especially, about tobacco use from cigarettes, cigars, pipes, chew, snuff, and other nicotine products like vaping. And finally, they advocate for public and private policies that ensure healthy places to live, work, and play. You can learn all about Tobacco Free Adagio Health on their website, tobaccofree.adagiohealth.org. We also have a VBC magazine. If you are new to us, we provide this quarterly for free. Uh, if we if you don't get it, it's because we don't have your address. You can email Todd or myself. Just use our first name, Todd, D-O-D-D, -D, or Sean, S-H-A-U-N, at veteransbreakfastclub.org. Let us know your address, and we would be happy to send you a copy of our VBC magazine. It's exceptional. This is coming up. Todd, are we, do we have our confirmed next cover? I know this is still sort of a mock-up. Yes, we do. We have the oh. confirmed. We, the Converve co cover it is at the printer, and people should start receiving uh, paper copies of the magazine next week. So Elvis is our cover boy? Yes. Excellent. Well, uh, and we have two podcasts currently ongoing. We have a new uh, Lioness that will be recorded this week. Uh, Lioness, this podcast, tells the story of the women who served mm -hmm. in Iraq in 2003. They were uh, in combat despite the combat exclusion policy. Uh, this tells their story from the Army perspective, but then we do get into the Marines, the FETs, female engagement teams, as well as the cultural support teams. Uh, this is a very popular podcast. Uh, we've only had it out for about a month or two, and we've had over a thousand downloads. Uh, this is a story that you don't want to miss, and I believe VBC may be the only one who's telling it. So uh, we will put a link in the chat or just Google search Lioness, the origin story, and give it a listen. I highly recommend it. We have a new scuttlebutt this week, veteran power. Howard Films. I got to sit down with uh, two uh, established actors who are also veterans, Marine Corps veterans. They established Veteran Powered Films. It's all about a film production company by veterans and for veterans, uh, but they also do incorporate some non-veterans in there, but they are all committed uh, to, as we all know here, Hollywood doesn't usually get it right when talking about veterans or portraying veterans, but Veteran Powered Films, they're one of their main missions, in, besides helping veterans, is portraying veterans truthfully on film. It's a great Scuttlebutt podcast. Hope you get a chance to listen in. We have a couple other programs coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, Todd, Thursday. 
Yes, Thursday, we're doing another lecture conversation about the history of the Vietnam War. Uh, as you know, we're, we're the Veterans Practice Club is doing its third trip to Vietnam with veterans and others. 21 of us are leaving on November 27th. And in preparation for that, I've been doing these. I've, in my former life, I've, I've taught college courses on the history of Vietnam, the Vietnam War. And uh, so in preparation for our trip, I've been doing a series of talks about the history of Vietnam. And we will be covering on Thursday night at 7 p.m. right here at the same Zoom uh, address. Uh, we'll be covering the First Indochina War and World War II in Vietnam, the rise of the Viet Minh and, and Ho Chi Minh. So join us at 7 p.m. on Thursday night. It's always a really interesting group that we get and uh, we get involved in the fascinating conversations. And coming up next Monday. Yeah, next Monday is another anniversary. The first week of November 1983, the world came closer to nuclear war than it ever had before, including the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, very few people knew it at the time, however. It's called the Abel Archer Nuclear War Scare of 1983. And we're having uh, Air Force Intelligence Officer Brian Mora, who's written a book about it, uh, come on the program. And we're going to talk about those who were, uh, we're going to talk about the scare, how it unfolded, what exactly happened. Abel Archer was a war NATO war exercise in in Europe, and that the Soviets mistaken mistook for a possible first nuclear strike. And uh, so we'll talk about that crisis, how it unfolded, how it was discovered later, and um, uh, and, and then we'll also talk with some veterans who who lived through it. So join us next Monday night, October thirtieth, seven p.m. And I'll bounce off that term. Join us. We also have a membership online and i'll bring it up simply because we recently this past week passed 1000 members for the vbc nice. God, i don't know if you know that 1000 members know that. yeah wonderful so hey, you don't have to be a member to join our free events uh we are always open and welcome to everybody but becoming a member sort of helps us keep the lights on as we say in the nonprofit world um it helps us to continue to provide quality programming for everybody uh it's 36 dollars per year and uh we thank you so much uh for supporting us in that. We'll cut, we'll cut in with a little commercial break a little later, but I'm going to jump to We Came in Peace, the trailer by Michael Ivey. He couldn't join us tonight, but we promised him we would show the trailer here to help set us up for our conversation this evening. Let me share my screen. Here we are. It was a tragic, very tragic time. You know, the lives lost at the embassy, the lives lost at, at the, the, the barracks compound. It's almost like we, we don't want to remember it. It's like a, a black eye. But uh, for those that were involved in it, they'll never forget it. And their families that were involved in it, they'll never forget it. But it thanks a lot of people, it's not they never forgot it, they just didn't ever hear about it. A step grandson uh, named Stefan, and he knows I'm I'm a Marine. You cut me open, I bleed Marine Corps green. And he gave me a book. It's about 400 pages of Marine Corps history, and it goes into detail uh, from their dress to uh, Tun Tavern to uh, Archibald Henderson to Korea, Vietnam, all of it. There's two paragraphs on Beirut. It's just very disappointing to know that it's been kind of swept into the dustbin of history and forgotten. I mean, when I went back to college, they go, they talk about World War II, Korea, Vietnam, uh, and then from Vietnam, it jumps right into Gulf War I. And every, there was a lot of stuff in between. We lived it, and we forgot about it. The government of Lebanon has requested, and I have approved, the deployment of United States forces to Beirut as part of a multinational force. In the days ahead, they and forces from France and Italy will be playing an important but carefully limited non-combatant role. The parties to the plan have agreed to this role and have provided assurances on the safety of our forces. You're going to run into situations. See, that's the thing before you go in that you think about on a, on a peacekeeping mission. 
is, uh, you know, what's my purpose here? You know, I can remember, you know, standing at the airport and seeing these rockets flying all over the place. And how the hell did we get in the middle of all this? I was the fourth Marine unit going into Beirut doing rigorous patrolling, both foot and mobile. At the same time, working with the people, helping them get on their feet. That's what the Lebanese mission was really all about in a, in a strategic sense. You're taking care of people. You're trying to make sure that the uh, bad people don't get an opportunity to take over and hurt the good people. When we have our rules of engagement, our procedures, our conduct in combat, peacekeeping, the restraint, and all those things that have it, that sounds very good, and it works, you know. But the other side, they have their vote. They see what we're doing. They know what our vulnerabilities are. I expect it to be hit. You could smell it in the air. It'd uh, start going downhill in a hurry. And we got hit with uh, unimaginable uh, ferocity, a horrific terrorist act. With dawn just breaking, a truck, looking like a lot of other vehicles in the city, approached the airport on a busy main road. At the wheel was a young man on a suicide mission. The truck smashed through the doors of the headquarters building in which our Marines were sleeping and instantly exploded. The four-story concrete building collapsed in a pile of rubble. At almost the same instant, another vehicle on a suicide and murder mission crashed into the headquarters of the French peacekeeping force. 241 Americans and 58 French peacekeepers died. And just thinking about it still makes tears well up in my eyes. And just how many men, good, solid, stable men, not any one of which I would have been proud of to be my brother or my son. But they, they, were, uh, they were killed. It was a strategic weapon, and it accomplished a strategic mission. They were objective is to not only remove America, but all Western influence, the peacekeeping force, withdraw from Lebanon, and, uh, and a change in the United States foreign policy. And they did it. And they did it. I still think it was a big mistake not to have some retribution. You have to answer that, and I think we've paid a price for that because it whet the appetites of the terrorists and so on. I hate terrorists. And uh, I guess I have a reason to. See there, AmericanBrotherFoundation.org. You can find out more about the documentary We Came in Peace. Uh, on their website, which is wecameinpeace.us. Stop share here. Uh, I know that we posted about this program, so it's possible several people may be joining us that are Beirut veterans um, that we may not know and may be new to us. If that's the case, if this is your first time joining us, again, we're the VBC, Veterans Breakfast Club. You could raise your hand or shake your hand if you've never uh, uh, joined us before, if you're a Beirut veteran uh, joining us for the first time. Um, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, Brad, I wanted to hand it over to you for intros uh, for the veterans that we did know were showing up. Uh, take it away. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, today, October 23rd, is a, is a very solemn day for the, the Marine Corps and the United States. Um, and tonight, we're so honored to have Beirut veterans with us uh, to help tell their stories, to help remember the fallen, and, and not to forget. And uh, we're fortunate to have uh, these uh, Marines with us. Uh, I'll just go right uh, along the screen here. My friend Chuck Dallahy, 
uh, a survivor of the building uh, blast and a retired colonel in the Marine Corps. We served together at headquarters Marine Corps after the Beirut bombing. He's been very instrumental in connecting me with a lot of Beirut veterans so they could appear on the show tonight. My uh, friend Mel DeMars, who was with a uh, helicopter squadron that came into Beirut after the blast, as you know, we had a show on Grenada and Mel, uh, Mel told a story about the rescue of some downed pilots during that show. We have Jeff Hammond, who runs the uh, Memorial Online out of Jacksonville, a uh, former corpsman, and Major General uh, Riviera, who gave us a great background on the Paul Mill situation in Beirut, very complex. And that was done last week, and that show is available if you want to go back and, and review that. Uh, my friend Jerry Walsh is here, Colonel, USMC, retired. And uh, again, he was at headquarters with Chuck and I after the Beirut bombing and just happens his wife and my wife are from the same small town in Virginia, Hamilton, Virginia. So good to see you, Jerry. And uh, let me go across here and... Uh, see, Larry Gerlock is here with us. Did he uh, check in? He did, yes. Oh, great. And uh, we, have, we have Lieutenant Colonel uh, Jerry Gerlock with us. He was the battalion commander of 1st Battalion, 8th Marines, a Vietnam veteran, uh, wounded very severely in Vietnam, made a miraculous recovery, and was severely wounded again in the Beirut bombing. And he's what, here with his wife, Patty, I believe. And uh, welcome aboard, sir. Good to have you with us. And let me see if we have anybody else. Okay, and I'd like to come back to uh, our guest, uh, Arnie Resnikoff. Rabbi Resnikoff is with us. Uh, he was a Navy chaplain for almost 25 years. He was in Beirut as a chaplain with the Sixth Fleet. Uh, interesting, he has a background in, in, he's a Vietnam veteran, was in riverine operations and naval intelligence before becoming a rabbi. And we'll be featuring a clip of him uh, giving his report. A report was given by to him to President Reagan. And we're going to see that clip in a minute here. But uh, the rabbi is kind of special. He was the first chaplain to teach a course at the Military War College. He was involved in the creation of Vietnam Veterans Memorial. And he delivered the closing prayer at the dedication in 1982. He's the former national director of interreligious affairs for the American Jewish Committee and is the former special assistant for the chief of staff of the U.S. Air Force Values and Vision. And I guess he comes from a long line of rabbis, your grandfather and great-grandfather. He's living in Washington, D.C., and we look forward to hearing your story, Rabbi, to help set the stage for further discussion. Thank you. I'll play the clip now. Um, I'm sure everyone can see this. And tonight, I'd like to share an account that I received that shows how God works in our lives, even in the darkest of towers. This report concerns the Marines in Beirut, brave men who believed that the goal we sought in that place was worthy of their best and gave their best. In the end, hatred centuries old made it impossible for Lebanon to achieve peace when we and so many others hoped it would. But while they were there, those young men of ours prevented widespread killing in Beirut, and they added luster, not tarnish, to their motto, Semper Fidelis. I'm going to read to you another man's words, and they're words that perhaps answer what I said a moment ago about whether we sometimes were shaken in our faith and in our, in our beliefs. On that October day, when a terrorist truck bomb took the lives of 241 Marines, soldiers, and sailors at the airport in Beirut, one of the first to reach the tragic scene was a chaplain, the chaplain of our Sixth Fleet, Rabbi Arnold E. Reznikov. And here is what he finally felt urged at the end of that day to put down in writing of the experiences of that day. He said, I, along with Lieutenant Commander George Pooch Pucciarelli, the Catholic chaplain attached to the Marine unit, faced a scene almost too horrible to describe. 
Bodies and pieces of bodies were everywhere. Screams of those injured or trapped were barely audible at first as our minds struggled to grasp with the reality before us. A massive four-story building reduced to a pile of rubble, dust mixing with smoke and fire obscuring, obscuring our view of the little that was left. Because we'd thought that the sound of the explosion was still related to a single rocket or shell, most of the Marines had run toward the foxholes and bunkers, while we, the chaplains, had gone to the scene of the noise, just in case someone had been wounded. Now, as the news spread quickly throughout the camp, news of the magnitude of the tragedy, news of the need for others to run to the aid of those comrades who still might be alive, Marines came from all directions. There was a sense of God's presence that day in the small miracles of life which we encountered in each body that despite all odds still had a breath within. But there was more of his presence, more to keep our faith alive in the heroism and in the humanity of the men who responded to the cries for help. We saw Marines risk their own lives again and again as they went into the smoke and the fire to try to pull someone out or as they worked to uncover friends all the while knowing that further collapse of huge pieces of concrete precariously perched like dominoes could easily crush the rescuers. There was humanity at its best that day. Not a and a reminder not to give up the hope and dreams of what the world could be in the tears that could still be shed by these men, regardless of how cynical they had pretended to be before, regardless of how much they might have seen before. Certain images will stay with me always, he writes. I remember a Marine who found a wad of money amidst the rubble. He held it at arm's length as if it were dirty and cried out for a match or a lighter so that it could be burned. No one that day wanted to profit from the suffering of catastrophe. Later, the chaplains would put the word out that the money should be collected and given to us, for we were sure that a fund for widows and orphans would ultimately be established. But at that moment, I was hypnotized with the rest of the men and watched as the money was burned. Working with the wounded, sometimes comforting, simply letting them know help was on the way, sometimes trying to pull and carry those whose injuries appeared less dangerous in an immediate sense than the approaching fire or the smothering smoke. My kippa was lost. That is the little headgear that is worn by rabbis. The last I remember it, I'd used it to mop someone's brow. Father Pucciarelli, the Catholic chaplain, cut a circle out of his cap, a piece of camouflage cloth which would become my temporary head covering. Somehow he wanted those Marines to know not just that we were chaplains, but that he was a Christian and that I was Jewish. Somehow we both wanted to shout the message in a land where people were killing each other, at least partially based on the differences in religion among them, that we, we Americans, still believed that we could be proud of our particular religions and yet work side by side when the time came to help others to comfort and to ease pain. Father Pucciarelli and I worked that day as brothers. The words from the prophet Malachi kept returned, recurring to me, words he'd uttered, uttered some 2,500 years ago as he had looked around at fighting and cruelty and pain. Have we not all one Father, he had asked. Has not one God created us all? It was painfully obvious, tragically obvious, that our world still could not show that we had learned to answer yes. Still, I thought perhaps some of us can keep the question alive. Some of us can cry out, as the Marines did that day, that we believe the answer is yes. Before the bombing, Pooch, that's his name for the other chaplain with him, and I had been in a building perhaps a hundred yards away. There had been one other chaplain, Lieutenant Danny Wheeler, a Protestant minister who had spent the night in the building which was attacked. Pooch and I were so sure that he was dead, 
that we had promised each other that when the day came to return to the States, we would visit his wife together. Suddenly, Pooch noticed Danny stole what he used to call his Protestant talent. Because it was far from the area Danny was supposed to have been in, there was cautious hope that perhaps he had been thrown clear, that perhaps he had survived. Later, Danny would tell the story of his terror. He was under the rubble, alive, not knowing what had happened, and not knowing how badly he was hurt. Then he heard voices of the Marines searching near his stole and his cry for help was answered with digging, which lasted four hours before he was dragged out alive. Danny told me later that I treated him like a newborn baby when he came out, that I counted his fingers and toes, trying to see that he was whole. I didn't realize that I was so obvious, but the truth is that we couldn't believe that he was in one piece. I hugged him as they brought over a stretcher. I can still hear his first words. Racked with pain, still unsure of his own condition, he asked how his clerk was. Like so many of the men we would save that day, he asked first about others. These men, the survivors, still had no idea of the extent of the damage. They still thought that perhaps they'd been in the one area of the building hit by a rocket or mortar. We would wait until later to sit with these men and tell them the truth, to share with them the magnitude of the tragedy. After the living were taken out, there was much more work to be done. With the wounded, with those who had survived, there was the strange job of trying to ease a gnawing feeling of guilt that would slowly surface. Guilt. I was talking about the guilt that was felt by the men who were alive. The guilt that they had somehow let down their comrades by not dying with them. That is something that happens a great deal in combat. So our job, he said, was to tell them how every life saved was important to us, how their survival was important to our faith and our hope. They had to give thanks with us that they still had the gift and the responsibility of life which would go on. With others, the Marines who stayed behind to continue the job of digging, a terrible, horrifying job of collecting human parts for identification and for eventual burial, there was the job of comforting them as they mourned. Thankfully, the self-defense mechanism within us took over from time to time, and we were able to work without reacting to each and every horror that we would encounter. But suddenly, something would trigger our emotions. Something would touch our humanity in a way impossible to avoid. For some, it would be the finding of a friend's body, someone filled with life only days before. For others, it would be a scrap of paper or a simple belonging, a birthday card, or a picture of someone's children, which would remind them that there was no, this was no abstract body count of 240 mili military casualties. This was a tragedy of people where each was unique and each had a story, each had a past, and each had been cheated of a future. As the Mishnah puts it, each was a world. We were not digging up 240. We were digging up one plus one plus one. I have a personal memory of two things which brought to my mind images of life, images which haunt me still. One was a packet of three envelopes tied together with a rubber band. On top, under the band, was a note which read, to be mailed in case of death. The other was a Red Cross message delivered the next morning. The American Red Cross is the agency used by many Navy families to communicate medical news from home. This message was a birth announcement. A baby had been born, and we were to deliver the good news. Only now, there was no father whom we could congratulate, no father to whom the news could be conveyed. That message stayed on the chaplain's desk for days. Somehow, we couldn't throw it away. So it stayed on the desk, and without mentioning it, we all seemed to avoid that desk. I stayed in Beirut for four more days before finally returning to Italy and to my family. During those days, as the work went on, a Marine here or there would send a silent signal that he wanted me, that is, a chaplain, near. Sometimes it was to talk, 
Sometimes it was so that he could shrug his shoulders or lift his eyes in despair. Sometimes it was just to feel that I was near. For despite the struggles I might be feeling on a personal level, I was a chaplain, and therefore a symbol that there was room for hope and for dreams, even at the worst of times. In our tradition, of course, when we visit the home of a mourner during Sheva, the first week following the death of a loved one, visitors follow a simple rule. If the mourner initiates the conversation, the visitor responds. Otherwise, you sit in silence, communicating concern through your very presence, even without words. Somehow, I applied those rules during those days of digging. When a soldier or sailor said something, I responded. Otherwise, I stood by. During all of my visits to Beirut, I, along with the other chaplains, spent much time simply speaking with the men. Informal discussions, whether going on while crouched in a foxhole or strolling toward the tent set up for chow, were just as important as anything formal we might set up. I remember the first time I jumped in a foxhole, the first time the shells actually fell within the U.S. area. Looking around at the others in there with me, I made the remark, that we probably had the only interfaith foxholes in Beirut. The Druze, Muslims, Christians all had theirs. The Jewish forces in the Israeli army had theirs. But we were together. I made the comment then that perhaps if the world had more interfaith foxholes, there might be less of a need for foxholes altogether. To, to understand the role of the chaplain, Jewish, Catholic, or Protestant, is to understand that we try to remind others, and perhaps ourselves as well, to cling to our humanity even in the worst of times. We bring with us the wisdom of men and women whose faith has kept alive their dreams in ages past. We bring with us the images of what the world could be, of what we ourselves might be, drawn from the visions of prophets and the promises of our holy books. We bring with us the truth that faith not only reminds us of the holy in heaven, but also of the holiness we can create here on earth. It brings not only a message of what is divine, but also of what it means to be truly human. It's too easy to give in to despair in a world sometimes seemingly filled with cruelty and brutality. But we must remember not just the depths to which humans might sink, but also the heights to which they may aspire. That October day in Beirut saw men reach heroic heights. Indeed, heights of physical endurance and courage, to be sure, but heights of sacrifice, of compassion, of kindness, and of simple human decency as well. And even if the admission might bring a blush to the cheeks of a few of the Marines, heights of love. Long ago, the rabbis offered one interpretation of the biblical verse which tells us that we are created in the image of God. It does not refer to physical likeness, they explained, but to spiritual potential. We have within us the power to reflect as God's creatures the highest values of our Creator. As God is forgiving and merciful, so can we be. As He is caring and kind, so must we strive to be. As he is filled with love, so must we be. Because of the actions I witnessed during that hell in Beirut, I glimpsed at least a fleeting image of heaven. For in the hearts and hands of men who chose to act as brothers, I glimpsed God's hand as well. I did not stand alone to face a world forsaken by God. I felt I was part of one created with infinite care and wonderful, awesome, potential. We live in a world where it's not hard to find cause for despair. The chaplain has the challenge to bring to those who often see terror at its worst some reason for hope. We need to keep faith and to keep searching, even in the worst of times. Only then may we find strength enough to keep believing that the best of times might still be. These were the words of Lieutenant Commander Reznikov. I read them because I just felt that all of us, and I know how 
much you do of this. Let us strive to live up to the vision of faith that Chaplain Reznikov saw that day, and let us not never stop praying and working for peace. Thank God and thank you and God bless you all. Extremely powerful. Rabbi, there's probably lots of questions on everyone's minds. Um, and we're obviously everyone, if you have a question, please put it into the chat. Um, I, I think the first one among many questions in my head, but were you told that President Reagan would read this? No. Uh, am I unmuted? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, wonderful. No, what happened was uh, four days after the attack, the White House team came. And as many of you will remember, it was a small White House team led by then Vice President George H.W. Uh, Bush. And uh, he asked me to write a report uh, for the White House. He said, just in an, in an envelope, put something on top that said this was being mailed at the request of the Vice President. And uh, I received a beautiful letter from President Reagan thanking me. And uh, it's on my wall, of course. And uh, President Reagan's letter thanked me for my words and said, he, I hope you won't uh, mind if I share your words with others. So I showed that letter to my admiral. I was on the staff of the Commander Sixth Fleet on his flagship. And my admiral said, that means he's going to let Nancy read it. And uh, the next thing we know, we got a video from the White House showing this speech. And that was President Reagan addressing Jerry Falwell uh, and 20,000 Southern Baptists at the Washington DC Convention Center. So we were all surprised. Brad, you had uh, an interesting question, I'm sure, for the, for the rabbi. Yeah, I, 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 Rabbi had an excellent uh, show yesterday, but I asked him a question, Rabbi, what's your message today to the veterans and families that still suffer and grieve over this loss 40 years ago. Yeah, you know, uh, as I told Brad, there's no easy answer to difficult questions. You know, we can just struggle. You know, in Judaism, we have the expression, and now it's been adopted by many others, may the uh, memory, you know, of the dead bless the living, inspire the living. So, I don't know if we really can ease someone's pain, but I think that we can uh, love the memory and we can make a decision that the memory is going to inspire us. We can make a decision that when people die bravely, when people give their life for our country, when people stand up in uniform, uh, that has to inspire us to, to do it, be even a small part of the human being that, that they were, you know, as I said in that uh, report, uh, you know, a lot of times people feel guilty that they survived and others didn't. So one of the very first things we tried to do as chaplains, you know, was talk to the survivors and say, now they were kind of chosen. They were chosen to keep the memories alive, to tell the stories. And that's why I'm so happy that all of us are doing that. You. When you sat down to write this report, I mean, it seems to me the way that Reagan, of course, presented it sounds like it's so poetic in a way, but did it help you to bring peace within yourself of, of this tragedy? No one's ever asked me that before, but the answer is yes. And it took me uh, a while, you know, it, 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 I waited four days more in Beirut, then I went home to Italy. Um, I, I, you know, it, it took a while, it took a number of weeks. and. When I write something, the way my, my uh, spirit works or my mind works is I think and I think and I have an idea and I have an idea. And then I finally sit down and it flows. So I don't think I took a break uh, writing that. I just had thought about it and thought about it. And it just poured out of me and I put it in an envelope. By the way, I asked my admiral, should I send this through the chain of command? Uh, to the to the president, and he said, "Are you crazy? You're a lieutenant commander. 
you'll be dead before it gets to him if you go through the chain of command. If the vice president uh, invited you to send it directly to the White House, that's what uh, you should do. We had thought before the program we were only going to play a small piece of this, um, but we were encouraged that Chuck Dalhey, you, you encouraged us to, to play the, the whole speech. Chuck, had you heard the whole speech prior to tonight? Oh, yes. I've heard it a number of times. Matter of fact, uh, I had Rabbi Resnikoff uh, speak to chaplains several times while I was on active duty. Uh, I invited him to speak at chaplain balls, and we'd show this video to the audience of chaplains, uh, and then the rabbi would, would talk to the video. What do the words mean to you? Oh, go ahead, Rabbi. See. I, if anyone's interested, just to explain why I was in Beirut during the attack, you know, I was one of three chaplains on the staff of the Commander Sixth Fleet, Vice Admiral Martin, who was a, a Catholic, a Protestant, and, and me. And we were on the flagship, Puget Sound, which was stationed in Gaeta, Italy. And uh, our job was to circuit ride. At that point, the Navy was much larger. So at any given time, there were about 40 ships in the Sixth Fleet. You know, any ship that's in the Mediterranean is part of the Sixth Fleet until it leaves. And so I would circuit ride ship to ship and then to the Marines in Beirut. So I had made many visits, but uh, this particular time, the fifth Marine to be killed uh, in Beirut with the multinational force was Alan Seufert from New Nashua, New Hampshire. And because he was Jewish, um, you know, the body was sent back to New Hampshire as quickly as possible. Because in Judaism, we believe a speedy burial that you bury the physical body and then focus on the memories. But, and this always struck me only in America, it was the other Marines, it was, it was the other people in Beirut who thought that out of respect for Seufert's religion, that a Jewish chaplain should lead a memorial service. You know, the two chaplains attached to the Mao were Protestant chaplain Danny Wheeler and Catholic chaplain uh, George Pucciarelli. So I came in from Gaeta. It wasn't an easy trip. Uh, I had to go from Diana in Naples, Naples to Sigonella, Sigonella to Cyprus, and then helicopter in because the airport was closed. So by the time I arrived, it was Friday, October 21st. I have a photo that I hadn't seen before. Someone just sent it to me, but in the memorial service for Seufert, purposely, I asked Chaplain Wheeler and Chaplain Pucciarelli to join me, we joined hands for the 23rd Psalm because in that country where so many people were battling each other, you know, at least partly because of religion, we wanted to show unity. So uh, I was offered the first uh, leg of the trip back to uh, Italy the next day, at least as far as Cyprus. And I said, that's Shabbat, the Jewish Sabbath. I don't travel unless I'm helping to save someone's life. So I waited till Sunday. And that's the reason I was there 6.22 a.m. on Sunday when the uh, uh, attack occurred. I know we don't want to maybe go into too much detail um, about, you know, the events of the, of the bombing. Uh, but can you lead us through the days after, Rabbi? How were you able to comfort? How were you able to uh, keep peace amongst everyone? Well, you know, the, the immediate aftermath, as all of you who were there remember, we didn't have time to think. It was just once once we could focus and understand what happened. You know, I, I sometimes tell people that, you know, when, when it happened, uh, I happened to be brushing my teeth and our... Uh, a building, you know, shook. I was in the other building and I threw myself to the ground. I crawled out and I saw everybody was on the ground. And uh, when we stood up, I remember that if I'm remembering clearly, there was a, a few seconds where we were thanking God that we had made it, that the building had shook, had held, because we still thought we had been hit. And then when we heard all the screams, we finally realized it was the other building. So Pucciarelli, put a purple stole around his neck because he knew he, he would be uh, administering last rites. And he just said two words to me, follow me. We ran outside and, 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 and 
you know, the building wasn't there. And, and literally, I couldn't believe my eyes. I thought I was going in the wrong direction or something. And there was so much dust and, and smoke in the air. So, uh, you know, all we did was we tried to comfort the wounded. Uh, we tried to uh, tell people help was on the way. We, we tore, I, I was in my undershirt and trousers because I had been brushing my teeth, tore my undershirt apart and uh, tried to, you know, wipe uh, people's faces, brows, bodies. And uh, so that first day we were just trying to help the wounded. Then, you know, we changed to digging uh, to find, to hope someone else was alive, but Danny Wheeler was the final one to be pulled out. After that, it was just looking for remains. So those were the times that just talking to people, just trying to encourage them to keep up their faith, to, you know. And then that fourth day, the White House team arrived along with uh, Vice President uh, Bush and, and a few people from the White House. PX Kelly came uh, as the commandant. Um, my Admiral, the uh, Commander Sixth Fleet came, uh, just a few people. And then uh, on the fourth day, uh, General Kelly invited me to go with him. Uh, he was flying to Italy to visit the uh, hospitals that had a lot of Marines in them. So I went with him bed by bed as he pinned purple hearts on people. And then uh, the uh, Navy sent me back to Gaeta in a car. Rabbi, I can't imagine how long you were probably awake during this whole time. And how how do you keep the faith during that? The, an unimaginable tragedy in front of you, and, and you have to keep taking steps forward. And how did you keep pushing yourself? Yeah, you know, it's such a difficult question, and every person would answer it differently. I'm sure everybody here who has been there or in other attacks would answer it differently. You know, it's it's interesting that uh, part of it is expectation. You know, unfortunately, uh, the Jew Judaism just um, expects suffering to be part of life, and there has been so much suffering. So the idea is, how do you uh, overcome it? You know, to, there's a, a joke about the stereotypical Jewish telegram. It says, uh, uh, you know, uh, terrible news, details to follow. So, uh, you know, we just know there's going to be so much suffering. The challenge has always been uh, to keep faith that things will get better, to keep faith, you know, that there will be better times. And so that's what gave me hope. And also, you know, as I said in the report, the humanity of the people there caring for their brothers, crying for their brothers. Uh, I, I saw the humanity that gave me hope. Can you tell us a bit about, about Pooch? How you were both able to, you know, you, you found the other chaplain. Uh, how were you both able to connect with each other and, and stay close during this? You know, uh, whenever I would visit, you know, we, Wheeler would be in one building, the uh, one that was hit, Pooch would be in the other, and I would alternate. I would stay once in one building, once in the other. And uh, actually, that visit, it was my turn to stay with Wheeler. Um, but Pooch said he had something he wanted to talk to me about. I have no idea what it was after all these years, but it might have saved my life because I stayed with him. But, you know, the three of us... Um, we're, we're united, you know, as chaplains, uh, you know, the, the, the famous four chaplains uh, day, the four chaplains day in World War II, when a priest, two ministers and a rabbi all died on a ship that was torpedoed by a German uh, U-boat. There's a postage stamp I have on my wall that came out of World War II, and it says, uh, interfaith in action. And that's always been the uh, the words that inspired me as a chaplain, interfaith in action. So we had a love to start with, but after that experience, we just became so close. And of course, Pooch went on to become the senior chaplain in the Marine Corps. Uh, today, the system has changed. Whoever is deputy chief of chaplains in the Navy 
is the chaplain of the Marine Corps. But back then it was a separate 06 assignment. So he got to that position and, and then he retired, but he was a legend in the uh, chaplain corps. He was a legend in the Marines. Um, Danny uh, got out of the uh, uh, military after uh, Beirut, soon after. Thank God he wasn't physically hurt, but uh, in the report I wrote for Reagan, I said he was buried four hours. In some articles I've seen that I might have underestimated that with all of our digging, I saw one that said he was buried for five and a half hours. But whatever it was, I can't imagine being buried and waking up and not knowing what was happened. So I just, I don't know if he was ever the same after that, but he and Pucherelli and I um, kept, you're kept in touch. And the last time I saw Pooch was on the 35th anniversary. There was a uh, uh, an event in the White House and Pooch and his sister were able to come up to that. And uh, I hugged him as if, uh, you know, I, in one way I hadn't seen him in a million years and in another way I had just seen him five minutes before that. Danny, I've only been in touch since he retired by uh, email, but in uh, uh, Michael Ivey's um, We Came in Peace documentary, uh, he showed me clips of his interviews with Pooch and with Danny. And, uh, you know, it almost made me cry to see them both talking and sharing their stories. Rabbi, how did you hold yourself together during all of this and not go break down in front of everyone? I, I just don't think uh, it was an option. You know, I just think uh, uh, I was so focused on doing what I could. And you're right. Who knows if any of us slipped at all. Uh, but uh, uh, I just, it just wasn't the time to think of myself. It, it, you know, I, I don't think there was a Marine there who was thinking of himself at that point. It was just, uh, what can I do to help everybody else? I want to bring open up the conversation a bit here, Brad. Uh, yes. Well, I was, I was wondering, I see my friend, uh, Jerry Walsh. Jerry, are you comfortable talking about uh, the events that you experienced immediately after the explosion? I know you were with uh, outside the building, you're on the perimeter um, and you came upon the building. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Yes, yeah. I'm happy to do that. Um, and if I, if I could, um, follow up with uh, um, the rabbi with a story about Father Pucciarelli. I, uh, when the, the bomb went off, I was about uh, 700 meters away inside of a bunker. I, um, uh, I stood up and the concussion wave from the bombing of the um, Marine headquarters knocked me back on my cot. That's how intense that, that blast wave was and the size of the, the bombing. Um, my first uh, responsibility was to uh, shore up the lines. I was in Charlie Company on the southern portion of the airport. We thought there would be a follow-on ground attack after the, the bomb went off. So uh, that took place. Um, my company commander, Chris Cowdery, who's, who's now passed on, went into the, the building. Uh, my understanding is, is that Chris Cowdery is the one who pulled Chaplain Wheeler out, Danny Wheeler out. Uh, amongst the other Marines that were rescuers. Uh, when he returned, uh, I had all the defensive perimeter set up. There was no ground attack that followed. So I went into the uh, headquarters where the, uh, the bomb took place. Uh, once I got there, we were receiving sniper fire. Helicopters were flying all around, uh, taking out the, the wounded and, the, and those killed in action. Uh, we had the British contingent of the multinational peacekeeping force set up an internal perimeter around the airport uh, headquarters building. Uh, there was numerous Lebanese uh, ambulances coming in to take away the Marines and take them to hospitals. Uh, regrettably, the, a lot of the Lebanese were stealing from the Marines uh, wallets, wedding rings, weapons. Um, so uh, the other Marines put a stop to that, the details of which no one will know uh, because it's not important. So um, when I got there, I was looking for some, uh, some wounded, none to be had. And um, there was a Marine, P-51, 
pinned between the roof and the third floor of the collapsed building, pinned from the waist up, facing upward toward the sky. He was screaming in agony um, because he was in such pain. Father Pucciarelli scaled the collapsed building, first floor, second floor, up to the third floor, and uh, put his shoulder underneath the Marine's torso that was dangling from the, from the building. Uh, the Marine continued to scream very loudly. And uh, as the helicopters were going over, as the incoming rounds were happening, as machinery was moving, as total chaos and smoke and debris, uh, it's almost like in a movie set, everything got quiet. And uh, we, several of us, myself included, focused on Father Pucciarelli. As he stuck his shoulder underneath the Marine, he was speaking to the Marine in hushed tones telling the Marine everything's going to be okay while the Marine was screaming for his wife and his children. And as the Marine's screams became more faint, Father Pucciarelli was still there, touching the Marine, shouldering the Marine to give him some relief. And uh, he gave the Marine his last rites. And as the Marine started to, to lose uh, his voice, he stayed there until uh, the Marine passed. He draped the poncho that Father Pucciarelli was carrying around the Marine's torso, climbed down the, the walls of the collapsed building, and went to give comfort to other Marines who needed it. As we know, there were Marines uh, that were grievously wounded. Uh, by that time, there was no recovery, as the, as the rabbi said. And uh, um, the helicopters continued to come in and out. It was a scene of chaos. I remember the smells, the sounds, uh, the the uh, uh, the fear, uh, the sniper fire. It was uh, as it was just uh, very difficult to to grasp what was going on. And uh, um, afterwards, I had to return to the front lines as we continued to get incoming fire. And uh, of note, uh, from that day forward, we had firefights every day and every night until we actually left Beirut in the middle of November. Uh, but uh, it's just a horrific event that took place and so many people's lives and the families of those Marines, sailors and soldiers altered for the rest of their lives. Uh, the one thing I can say is I'm proud to serve with those good men who uh, gave their lives in the defense of their country. And in my view, our presence there did save civilian lives of the Lebanese. Um, although at great cost to the, to the Marine forces, the American forces that participated. Thank you, Jerry. I, uh, I think we're all moved by that. I know that was difficult for you to, to talk about, and I, you probably have not talked about this very much, especially to your family. So I, I appreciate you coming aboard with us tonight to, to share that story. Thanks, Brad. Jerry, as you were recovering and you noticed the chaplains moving around in your story, what did it mean to you to see that? Well, I, I think the, uh, the fact that the chaplains were present gave us hope. It, it gave us a security blanket knowing that they were there and uh, the faith that they brought with them. I, I think it gave us strength. I think it gave us the perspective of um, selflessness as, as they were going about their business to, to take care of the fallen uh, and we're getting the sniper fire and they didn't even flinch at all. And, and uh, you know, and, it, and it, not only are they chaplains, but the, the humans that they are, I think is a testament to the cloth that they, they wear in the uniform and the service of their country that they, they wore. And uh, it, it was a, um, maybe it was unspoken by the Marines who were, who were doing the rescuing and still fighting, but the presence of a, of a chaplain, particularly the three chaplains that we had, uh, was also uh, very, very important to us. And uh, it's almost like having a, a father looking over you um, because of the peace and, and uh, calmness and strength that they instilled in all those, in all those around them. It's impossible tonight for us to say every name. Um, Jerry, do you have anyone in particular that you would like us to remember tonight? Yes, um, Bill Zimmerman. 
Bill was a uh, first lieutenant working in the headquarters building. And uh, we went to Officer Kennedy school, school together. We went to the base of school together, infantry officer course together. And we checked into the first battalion, eighth range together. Uh, Bill was a uh, great human being from Grand Rapids, Michigan. His mother, Hilda Zimmerman, is still alive today. She's 94 years old. Um, I gave her a call today, as a matter of fact. And uh, Bill was a, uh, um, a stellar Marine, a stellar human being, and, and uh, a great representative of what it is to be an American, a son, a brother, a, a uh, fellow Marine. Um, he was killed, and uh, he's buried back in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and um, I still think of him almost every day. That's one of many. Yes, thank you. Uh, Jeff, I unmuted you. Uh, I'd like you to talk a bit about the memorial down in Jacksonville, and there was a memorial today. Uh, I wonder if you could give us a few words. Yes, it was uh, It was very moving. There was more people by far than uh, I've ever seen in the past. You know, the five-year remembrances are usually the ones that are um, have the most people come to them, but this one was uh, by far an exception you know you know just for the parking the uh, banquet that was last night uh there was uh you know a lot of people it was a great presentation there was activities all throughout the weekend they had the showing that uh um, rabbi resnikoff mentioned of the uh documentary work in progress several people that are on this zoom call were on it uh colonel deleshi and uh, Rabbi Resenkoff and uh, Lieutenant Colonel Gerlat. So uh, the uh, Commandant of the Marine Corps spoke. He was the guest speaker. And uh, and he really, uh, you know, emphasized that, uh, you know, the, the true people that should be honored are the veterans and the uh, family next to Ken. So, I mean, I think he hit, he hit the right tone I, with uh, his uh, speech. So uh, um, it was a beautiful day. It couldn't ask for a better day. And, uh, you know, it's something I'll, I'll, I'll remember for a long time. Really and moving why, day. Why did they decide to build a memorial in Jacksonville? Well, that was the home of the uh, of the 1st Battalion, 8th Marines. And a lot of people don't know that the memorial was built and funded by the city of Jacksonville. When that uh, tragedy happened, it really left a gaping hole in the soul of, of a city. So many fathers, coaches, parents, neighbors, uh, you know, it was very tragic. And the impact was immense. And the city of Jacksonville not only put this... Uh, memorial together, but they also planted uh, 241 Bradford pear trees along the main highway leading into Jacksonville. And there continues to be memorials built and remembered across the, across the country. Yeah, if I could interject, um, actually the, uh, the, the Bradford pear trees, you could really consider that as the original Beirut Memorial. They had funds left over and that's what they, that's what they went and did the, the wall. And then they still had funds left over and they, they commissioned the statue. Um, unfortunately, the Bradford pears weren't really resilient and a few hurricanes or, or tropical storms that came by, I mean, kind of uh, uh, killed a few of them. So they were lined along uh, Lejeune Boulevard, and then they eventually went and they did a, a grove out um, beyond the city of Jacksonville. Uh, I think it's out near um, Geiger. It's closer to Geiger, but I'm not um, than it is. Uh, but it's beyond Camp Johnson. I know that it's, and uh, you know they have like a more resilient. Uh, I forget what it was. It was a uh, uh, the, the a new type type of a uh, plant. And I forget the name of it, but it's a little more resilient. So it's beautiful. I've been out there. It's Jeff, you were you were out of Beirut before the bombing, correct? Yeah, I never went to Beirut. I was in uh, uh, Toes, which is a anti-tank uh, weapon. 
-hmm. and they're part of tanks battalions. So, uh, you know, Sergeant, uh, Steve Russell, who was a uh, Sergeant of the guard in Beirut and Mike Toma, which you've seen in the documentary and, uh, a few other people were in, were in tow. So, uh, but yeah, I got out in 1981 and just before that. So. And your work in Beirut is an online memorial. Can you tell us a little bit about that, Jeff? Yeah, sure. I I was when I got out of the Navy, I was a hospital corpsman and I went um I was uh in the Navy Reserve and I got activated for Desert Storm and I went to the uh, field service uh field medical service school there in Johnson and I became an instructor there and we used to run the troops down to the monument and I didn't know the monument existed and I was just fascinated by it and I went along the names and uh, there was one name that stood out to me and I thought it was somebody that I had served with in a, a BAS, the battalion aid station. You know, he was, because we shared our battalion aid station with the engineering battalion. So um, I reached out to a uh, public affairs officer, Marine Corps, and then he hooked me up with uh, Judy Young, who was the kind of the head of the, the uh, Beirut connection, which is all the families. So we met up. She, just so happened to live pretty close to me. And so we met up and she provided me the name of this uh, person, the sister. And I drove down to the house and, uh, you know, I was, uh, she, uh, I wasn't really sure if it was him or not. So, you know, but she, she went back in the bedroom, pulled out a photo and brought it out. And I was really trying to, um, coach myself well if it isn't him you don't want to breathe a sigh of, sigh of relief because she lost her brother so i thought the best you know thing was just to kind of be a stone do stone face you know and uh, she brought it out and and i didn't it wasn't the person that i knew so uh you know i just you know sorry for your loss and that type of thing and then i i told judith young i said you know i kind of feel a little uncomfortable about continuing with the website now because the original intent was to get a face to a name you know so you know have all the names and uh but you know she was like no please please continue and they just really brought me into the family i mean i just feel like it's what's you know it's a real labor of love but i get a lot out of it too because i feel like a sense of family i mean i i uh feel comfortable around everybody and you know just so they know that i wasn't in beirut but uh, I do enough work that I think people tolerate me and all that. But um, back in the early days, it was really uh, a challenge because nobody had scanners and nobody had cell phones. So I had to go over to people's house with a scanner and a laptop and then ask them if they'd take the photo out. And I'd put it in the scanner and scan it and then get it in my laptop. And so it was like kind of a real challenge at first. But now in this digital age, everybody... Everybody has a scanner. Everybody has a cell phone. So, just in the last couple of years, uh, the, the you know the the uh, the idea that I had to get a face to a name really took off, and I've gotten everybody but one one Marine, and I've contacted. So there's 240 of the photos, you know, out of the 241, and I contacted the one missing uh, Marine's brother, and he indicated to me that you know he's part of a lawsuit and he he was, had some concern about engaging he called it me the media or whatever he he didn't want to engage with the media uh in any way to jeopardize you know his situation with the lawsuit or whatever so i i respected his position and all that i was really disappointed you know could, because i worked with the u.s embassy uh in beirut to get all the names i don't know if you've seen that display but they have a display of all so now it's a lot of value because all the all the photos are there except the one but just a matter of about two hours ago i the lawyer his lawyer came up to me and was you know telling me hi and just exchanging subtleties and all that pleasantries and uh i said you know <laughs> they asked me for a few you know things because i do a lot of research and find people and all that you know I said, can I get one favor from you? Like, maybe you could talk to him and see. I mean, but if he gets upset that I went around him, you know, just just drop it because I don't want any problem, you know. But but man, it's just, you know, it just would add so much value to the project to have all the faces up there behind a name. So 
but some of them, they aren't real high quality photos, but at least I have one. So what I'm going to do now is if they're able to obtain that one for me, which is the last one, I want to go back through them and try to get, you know, kind of a, a higher quality ones for the ones that are kind of black and white and scratchy and, and all that. Cause I, the, the most prized ones are the ones in their dress blues and they have the, you know, the Marine dress uniform and all that. So. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. And I should say the families have been tremendous about this. I mean, it, it, it's, it's really not my work. It's their, I mean, it's their project. I mean, you know, they've given me the photos. They verse me on the, uh, the hometowns, you know, and I try to get that right. So they, so in some cases when they're married Marines, it had them listed as Jacksonville, North Carolina, you know, um, yeah. because, you know, they have a family, they had a family then and all that. So, but the families would help me and they would say, you know, is it like, West Virginia is a town in West Virginia is most appropriate or, or whatnot. So they would, they would kind of work with me on that. And I, I think it has a, it's a pretty accurate, uh, you know, listing now. So. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jeff. I think we're going to, if we can put in the chat, the, uh, the site for your online memorial, the Beirut Memorial. Okay. All right. Thank you. What is that website? It's uh, a Beirut dash memorial.org and if okay. you go in the in memory section it has the list of all the of all the uh marines I, I if i could tell you one story this has always been meaningful to me i i actually do the casualties of 58 because i i heard that there was one person killed in 58 but then when i started researching it there was actually nine killed in 58 there was one i didn't get to meet up with him but there was one 1958 Marine that showed up at the thing down in Lejeune. I just didn't get to meet up with him. But um, so I got photos of all those. There was like eight of them. And I got photos of just about all of them except one. And there was one guy that was, he was considered a KIA. He was the only one. And he was, uh, he was listed as a uh, orphan. So I thought, well, the chance of finding anybody in his family is, you know, is, you know, slim to none but then i got a like a, a press briefing card that said that he had uh some brothers and sisters so what had happened i eventually found out through newspapers and all that in his brother was that uh the the mother and father were killed but they split up the children between several aunts and uncles so he did have real living relatives and i so i sorry i'm gonna choke up but i called his brother and, you know, I explained what I was trying to do and I was trying to get a photo and I wasn't sure if it was the person or not, you know, I didn't know if I got the right person and it was just dead silence on the other end of the phone. And I said, hello. And he said, yeah, I'm, I'm here. He said, I'm sorry. Nobody's ever talked to me about this in like 55 years. <laughs> so it, you know, it just kind of hit me and uh, he did get the photo and he sent it to me. The beautiful photo of the you know 1958 airborne uniform and all that so you know so uh these are you know it, I, I hate to redo reduce it to just photos because these are deeply meaningful pieces of memorabilia for for all these you know people so i even found that with the families it's it's if i get a photo from a vet the veterans have been really great i get a photo i immediately uh Try to get it to the widow or or a living child or whatever you know so because many times it's something they've never seen before and they're deeply appreciative of that so thank you thank you thank Jeff. You. sean if we, i think if we can try to get uh, lieutenant colonel larry gerlaw uh with us i think he's in the audience i'll ask larry to unmute I don't think you're muted. Yep, Larry, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me now? We can. Thank you, Larry, so much for joining us, Brad. Yes, sir. Thank you for joining us tonight. You were the battalion commander of 1st Battalion, 8th Marines. And I know this day is is uh, a difficult day, but a day that of remembrance. And I uh, I wanted to, to read a note 
if I can, that you wrote in April 2020. And this is what you said. To serve as the commanding officer of BLT-18 was one of the greatest honors of my life. When I think of you men, any of whom I would have been proud to have as a brother or son, I can say that you were everything that a brother in arms should be, tough, brave, loyal, and for the most part, always ready to laugh. You highly trained warriors were presented with a situation that changed, and I am proud to say you handled that change admirably. There's not a day that goes by that I don't think of you, Marines, sailors, and soldiers of 1-8, and your families of love and admiration. Semper Fidelis, Lieutenant Colonel Larry Gerlach, USMC, retired. I think that every day. And it was the highest honor of my life. I'm deeply proud of the men, all the Marines, sailors, and soldiers that I served with her and their families. They did all that was asked of them, and they died for the country. Say, uh, it's a heartfelt emotion. Yes, and I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of uh, everybody I served with there. They all did a great job. Now, you were a Vietnam veteran, of course, and severely wounded. I think you were shot uh, in the abdomen and made a very difficult recovery. You were wounded severely that day, October 23rd, 1983. And uh, you've, you've recovered. You've, you've had some challenges, I'm sure. But what's this day mean to you as you look back, Colonel? I'm sorry. What, I guess as you look back on this day, what, what, what comes to your mind? What message do you have for everybody that, that you may want to share? Well, it's keeping the faith. We've heard that before. The rabbi talked about keeping the faith. Well, with all that's going on in uh, the world today, all that's going on in uh, uh, the Middle East right now, and the uh, Iran is uh, right in the middle of this, just like they were... Uh, uh, it was proven in a court of law that they planned, financed, and executed the bombing. Now, a lot of people don't know that. And I still, today, I hear uh, where no one knows exactly for sure. Well, it was proven in a court of law that they, they uh, were the culprits. And they're, they're, they're in this mix again. They're still, I should say. We have to keep faith in our country. We have to keep faith that uh, we're going to make it work out. And it's hard to do that at times. Yes. Colonel, we've mentioned a couple names tonight. Is there a particular name that you would like us to remember? I think of all of them, but... Uh, uh, Sergeant Major Fred Douglas was an exceptional Marine. Uh, he could have been retired. What I, made him exceptional? They did everything they were asked to do and then some. They, uh, when we were, uh, uh, before our workup, we went through the uh, Marine Corps combat readiness test and uh, there was not one negative thing that was uh, was a finding. Uh, <laughs> I have a lot of good memories about it. I, uh, it was very and I and I, I, I <laughs> at loss for words now. I, I've got uh, I've got the words there, but. Uh, 
It's been an emotional day. It's no doubt. Patty's my wife is here with me. Hello. <laughs> Hello. And uh, and and the wives and the widows, they uh, they were wonderful. I have a, a short on the Beirut Memorial online Facebook page, Amelia Redding Winter Collier. She wrote something that you just brought to my attention, Colonel. It brought, it brought to my memory. As she said, I am a Beirut widow and I have been happily married to my second husband for 35 years this December. God has blessed me with two wonderful husbands. All of this to say, sometimes I feel guilty for still loving and missing my, my dead husband, especially this time of year. By the way, my husband is very understanding and respectful of my first husband. It's just a bunch of mixed up feelings, and I thought some of you might relate. Uh, the Beirut Memorial Online, we, we posted on there to let everyone know about us honoring the Beirut bombing tonight. As I was scrolling through their Facebook, I noticed that comment, um, and it sort of struck me. Um, and it, it, it reminded me that this wasn't just the Marines that that were killed it was the families the, the ripple effect out from that but uh her name is melia redding winter collier and brad you and i looked up who her husband was right i don't recall his name right off the bat but uh, name was bill winter he was the s4 of the battalion her name is malia malia thank you malia she, she was a terrific wife and um uh, I remember her with such fondness, and I'm so glad to hear her comment. It's Malia. I thought it was uh, poignant to point out not only that, but but their Facebook page that they also that if you don't know about it uh, and you are a Beirut veteran, you know, look up their uh, particular Facebook uh, group, um, the Beirut Memorial Online. Um, Jeff, I saw you shaking your head that you know about them. Um, it's, it seems like a really wonderful support group. We actually run that page. So, uh, but, oh. you know, just as a coincidence, I ran into her today. She was uh, talking with Kevin Jiggets, which most of you may know. And uh, he he actually introduced me to her because I didn't know her by name. So I had spoken with her uh, daughter and I think, her daughter and maybe somebody else because her daughter had given me pictures of him. So mm -hmm. was that I, was that in Jacksonville? Yes, ma'am. Uh, God bless Malia. I'll tell you, we had a wonderful group of wives. There had to be a, a an exceptional support group of the wives coming together. Todd, I want to bring you into the conversation. Um, I noticed that Bob Mizwa asked a question here in the chat uh, that maybe Brad, Jim, or Colonel Gerlach could could answer. Um, Bob Mizwa is, is Army veteran. I uh, said, what happened to the old axiom spread out and dig in? Who was responsible for placing the troops in this building, which obviously had inadequate defensive positions, especially in a combat zone? Um, and Todd, you uh, answered something also of a technical nature here as well about the, the uh, Weinberger Doctrine, which you can get to. But I thought to answer that question, Brad or Jim, Larry, you might be able to help us answer sort of why the why the troops were in that building to begin with. Well, we were the uh, fourth battalion to be in that building, and uh, I couldn't deploy. Because they were getting killed if they were not. No, no, this is, I would have deployed if I could have. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, I think the situation was, was very complex. You know, the threat uh, and the restrictions around that airport were many. The uh, main threat leading up to that was artillery and incoming rounds. And that building had withstood a lot of that type of threat and it had been occupied before. Unfortunately, the, the Lebanese army was responsible for the general security around the airport outside the Marine perimeter. And they insisted upon 
the airport being operational, and they also insisted upon the main road that led up to the airport to be open. So there were many factors that were out of the hands of, of the local commanders and, and placed the heavy, heavy restrictions on them, made their mission even more difficult. Uh, you know, I was only there for, for a month. I left before the building was blown up, but I did not walk away from there with a sense of poor security. Uh, I saw things that reinforced the idea that there was security there, but I'm not as qualified to speak about it as people that were on the ground. So I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, Brad, I'll, I'll, I'll just jump in and reiterate. Uh, we were the second group in, but uh, like I said, the building was a, uh, was a very substantial building and had um, sustained successfully artillery rounds, sniper rounds, and everything else, which was the threat at the time when the Marines moved in. And so they, they, they occupied that building uh, and it did successfully you know, protect the Marines that lived there up until the bombing. So that's, that's, that's the reason they were there. And I, I think uh, the investigations done afterwards, the FBI analyzed the bomb, its construction and its impact, and they determined even if the truck had exploded 350 feet from the building, the damage and the loss of life would have been the same. That's how large a blast and how powerful it was. We heard about that. So I, I do think, you know, we're dealing with something that's it was horrific and very well planned and executed by nation states. And I've also read that there was a that bomb could be detonated remotely, even if the driver of the truck was incapacitated, that another person could have set that bomb off. So there is so much we don't know about the Beirut bombing. And what we remember is the loss of life. But there's much, much more to the story. And a lot of it is uh, just unknown. And I'm so glad that we have actual Beirut veterans here with us tonight that can talk about this. Yeah, Brad, let me add something. August 1983, I stood on the roof of the building next to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. His name was General Vesey at the time. And he looked out at our perimeter and at everything we had. And he, and he turned to the Mau commander, Colonel Garrity, and he said, Tim, you're running a great operation here. Yeah. He didn't say anything about security. Yes. And you're right, Chuck. Uh, from what I've read, there was many, many visitors along the chain of command up and down that came and visited. And there was no one in, that, in fact, said uh, the state of the security. In fact, I know Colonel Garrity, after reading his book, he was pushing to, to alter the location of the headquarters. But a lot of his requests and suggestions went, fell on deaf ears. Yeah. I had requested moving and the uh, request came back and this was from the uh, uh, airfield uh, or the uh, might've been the Lebanese army, but it was uh, and this, I was not participating directly in the negotiations that were, were going on and there were negotiations going on. And, uh, we were offered some of the houses on the north end of the uh, airfield outside the fence. That wouldn't, we would have been subject to uh, more of the ongoing threats that were, uh, uh, that were, were happening. We, we lost the, uh, several men uh, snipers uh, the bomb itself if they would have pulled up on the road right out that i was looking out on the air the uh airfield road one right down to the terminal we had a uh, chain link fence there and some uh, sandbags and we had a sentry uh there and he had a whistle. If anybody stopped there, he could whistle. Oh, they weren't real quick about whistling. And what uh, would have happened if uh, they would have parked that truck there, taken off? What would have happened? They could have detonated to, to the right there. And the uh, 
disaster that occurred would have still occurred if when they came through and busted through the uh, the barbed wire uh, fence we had at the parking lot there from the size of that bomb uh, the initial estimates were uh, equivalent to 12,000 pounds of TNT I've, I've talked to several people about it and they say that uh, was an underestimation and they put that number in there because they knew that no one could argue with it it was it, it was much higher than that uh, did the guards have the ability to lay down spikes to deflate tires no could have laid out spikes for the tires did they have spikes to he's asking did they have spikes to but I don't think he did <laughs> No, Chuck, you said no? No, we didn't. Yeah. I don't know where you would put those spikes again, 350 feet away from the building. The blast would have caused the same amount of damage. I think, you know, in retrospect, you could, you know, you would have to almost surround that building as a moat, anti tank ditches, concrete in bank uh, emplacements, uh, which I think a lot of that was done later on. But again, uh, there was trouble getting intelligence down and the actual threat, uh, timely intelligence and actionable intelligence. So, uh, you know, in retrospect, things could have been done better, but you need to place yourself not only in a situation, but the very confusing change of command that we had. And, you know, the, some of the lessons from Beirut was to streamline the change of command where a commander doesn't have five different bosses. Um, I, I, need, I need to call you back. Okay. When I initially went into that building, I was told that there could be no impedance, obstacles on that parking lot because Let me call you. Let me call you on Sundays, people would, and it happened when we initially got out there, people would drive out and like tourists, and they were the natives of, of Beirut. And they'd they'd walk right around it. They're quite proud of their airport, their airfield. Just so you know, that phone call was from Chris Calvary's widow. Chris Calvary was a company commander. Uh, we mentioned his name already. Mm -hmm. And the the bottom line, we were on a peacekeeping mission. There's a War Powers uh, Act, uh, a lot of things going back and forth about uh, weapons that were impacting uh, within our perimeter, and uh, uh, some of the explanations were that uh, they were short runs. They were really shooting for the Army facility, which was across the highway from us. I don't know. I just threw a few of those things out, and you all can think about them. Yeah. I'm I'm struck by uh, Ben Wright's comment here in the chat about that we have short memories often, and we're sometimes slow learners. Ben, you reference a similar truck bomb in Saudi Arabia in 1996. Right. Yeah, Cobar Towers uh, was housing coalition forces that uh, were near an air base at Dahran. And a truck bomb drove up next to the building and uh, exploded, killed 19 active duty Air Force people and wounded some 498 people. And, you know, the, you know, the truck got in there. So, you know, that was, uh, you know, 96 or 13 years later in Saudi Arabia, a similar incident. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, here I am, a director of a veterans organization. I could not have named that bombing of 1996. Uh, I wouldn't know that 19 airmen lost their lives that day in a truck bombing. And I think it brings up something that we've talked about these last several weeks, Brad Washabaugh, that 
these operations that aren't big wars, that don't have big national memorials that lots of people go to and that don't get taught in schools. And as you know, as the We Came in Peace documentary, the, the one Marine said, don't often even get included in Marine Corps history, you know, not much of it. These operations, I imagine that people like, you know, Colonel Gerlach, who who survived it, um, and, and, you know, so many of you here, uh, that has to make the recovery and the, the uh, you know, grieving process kind of a little bit more difficult because you don't have a lot of people who could really reference what you experienced, the trauma you experienced. It, I imagine it must be a lonely a lonely kind of experience, the aftermath. Hey, Brad, some of these uh, participants want to part, uh, want you to unmute, unmute them so they can participate. Okay. Well, Todd, can we uh, arrange that? They raise their hand or unmute or? Okay. I'll just, I'll start unmuting people. Okay. Uh, somebody raised their hand with a comment or a question, please. Chris Perillo, right. Hey, Chris. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Very good, thank you. Um, Chris Perillo, U.S. Navy, uh, always an honor to be among you gentlemen. Thank you for the part to the participants who are vet be Beirut veterans for your service and for coming on here and sharing your story. Um, I hope this doesn't sound trivial, but this is what they call a historical footnote. Uh, today, we are watching live, up to the minute, news coverage of the Middle East and what is going to maybe amount to a pending war. I wanted to point out something. Um, I was a journalism uh, graduate in 1983, the year of the incident, and I contend that well, what happened was this incident coincided with a revolution in electronic news gathering in that year. And that uh, uh, things like uh, access to, um, to uh, satellites, uh, compact satellite ground terminals, satellite phones, um, the uh, correspondence on the ground, coordination between network news and local affiliates to bring you the story from the home front families and hometowns and a brand new thing called CNN 24 hour news coverage they all happened in this year and i contend i've contended for a long time that this incident was the very first time a military event was covered by these new technologies and brought everything right into the home almost in real time, if not in real time. And now 40 years later, those same technologies enhanced, but those same techniques, strategies, and uh, ways to deliver news in our society still hold true. But this incident was the very first time they were brought to bear and uh, and opened up uh, a window into uh, what, what the military goes through on the ground. Yes. That's all I want to say. Thank you. To make it I, um, go ahead, Patty. I think that's true. Um, the wives uh, of 1 8 were glued to uh, CNN at the time. Uh, actually, before the um, before the end of August, uh, when Sergeant Ortega and and uh, Lieutenant Losey were killed, we weren't really that worried. So that those of us who lived in town had cable. Those on the base that maybe had cable, maybe did not, because it wasn't the same. But after. Sergeant Ortega and uh, Lieutenant Losey were killed. Those who did not have CNN ran and got CNN, and we were glued. The wives, the first thing we did every morning was turn on CNN. And at that time, 
CNN was a wonderful news organization. I will have to say I don't think of them the same way now. But they really covered uh, Beirut wonderfully at that time. And we got a lot of information from CNN at the time. Yes. Thank you. I'd like to open up other Beirut veterans while we have the time. Yeah, and also, uh, also, if there's anybody uh, who wants to be, who wants to remember somebody in particular who lost their lives on this day 40 years ago. Yeah, I see Jerry raised his hand. Jerry Walsh, unmute, please. Let's see. Let me, let me find Jerry. He's under Heidi's iPad. Oh, Heidi's iPad. Heidi. Okay. Yeah. Got it. There we go. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah. If I could just add two things. First of all, I was at the National Museum of the Marine Corps uh, a few days ago, and they have a brand new exhibit for Beirut um, in the uh, museum itself. And uh, I think everyone will see uh, that it's worthwhile to stop by there and take a look. The other thing um, I wanted to talk about is um, as, as Marines value their, their birthday, November 10th, um, if I could just share a, a, a vignette about uh, what happened on November 10th in Beirut uh, for those that were in the building, like uh, Colonel Gerlach, Chuck Daly, uh, you may not know the story, but I, I wanted to tell it. Uh, on November 10th, we were expected to have uh, our birthday celebration meal flown in from the ship of, of lobster and steaks. Um, during the middle of the day, we started to get into an intense firefight, a lot of incoming mortars, uh, artillery, rockets, uh, small arms fire. And uh, when it came time for the ship to load the VAT cans into the aircraft to fly mm -hmm. them in, the Navy pilots uh, reneged on their commitment to fly that chow into the Marines, the birthday meal. The Marine pilots, however, did fly that in. And they flew it in with incoming fire because they knew the value and importance that meal had for the Marines on the ground, particularly on the day, November 10th, where they celebrate their birthday. So as we and Charlie Company were now at the northern end of the airport, receiving and returning fire, uh, the back cans were, were jeeped up to the uh, the hill we we're on with the old artillery battery was at, and we ate in shifts as we continued to to return fire to those uh, firing at us. The Marines would be pulled off the line, they'd have their birthday meal, and then they would return to allow others to have their meal. And uh, it's probably the best birthday meal I've ever had on November 10th, uh, back in 1983. And as a testament to the, to the Marine aviators who, uh, understood the importance of the day and uh, flew in the chow under fire and uh, it made for a great night. Uh, we didn't sleep that night. Our firefight ended probably about 0730 the following morning, but we had uh, a night um, of firefights with a full stomach and the Marines did their job. And I just wanna point that out for the aviators in the, in the crowd who may be listening. Thank you very much Thank for that you. birthday meal. Thank you, Jerry. Mel, were you flying? Uh, were you flying that meal in from the ship? Mel was a helicopter pilot uh, deployed to Beirut about this time. Okay. Well, no, not actually, because we uh, can you hear me now. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, we didn't get uh, my unit, uh, which was with the twenty second mile. We didn't get there until after the bombing. Of course, this was. No, we, we've actually pulled on station on November 17th, so it wouldn't have been us. Uh, it was, the squadron before us was uh, HMM 162, reinforced, of course, with the 53s and Cobras and Hueys. But, uh, yeah, they were the unit that uh, before us. So when I see some 162 guys, I will tell them that, that you appreciate their help. In fact, I was talking to one of the Cobra pilots from 162 today on the phone. So I will definitely pass that along. Thank you. 
Hey, John Grogan, I know that you uh, w- had your hand up at one point. Yeah, I had the good fortune to work with uh, with Fred Douglas at um, the uh, Marine Air Reserve Detachment in South Weymouth for a couple of years. I mean, he was he was the sweetest guy in the world. He was really a good friend of mine. And then um, Father Pooch came by. He would come by every so often. So I had a chance to meet both in the same place at the same time. I feel privileged to work with really privileged to work with Douglas. He, um, he had a heart as big as gold and, and the world is, is less of a place, is less of a place without him. So um, I miss him an awful lot and I salute him. Thank you, John. Jeff Hammond, I was struck by something you said earlier uh, that uh, you work hard so the Marines tolerate you and your and the work that you do on the. That's very much how I feel every day being a, you know, non-veteran working in the veterans field. Um and I, I think I've just this conversation has made me grow an appreciation for the work that you do to keep this, you know, the memory of this event alive. Well, thank you. I, w- I wanted that you had said if I come up with a name of somebody to be honored, um, just a bit of morbid trivia. Not all died on the 23rd of October. There were some that, you know, suffered, died days later, a week later, 10 days later. But the guy that I wanted to mention was a was an armor. His name was Corporal Terry Hudson, and he was badly, severely burned. And he went to a burn center in, I believe, it was San Antonio, Texas. And if you read about what he went through for weeks, you know, I mean, just like several heart attacks, you know, fluid in his lungs. He had several fingers burned off, and he ended up dying on. Uh, I believe it was like it was that first week in December. Um, and he was actually the last one to die to make 241. However, there was a gentleman that died or a Marine that died a week before that they announced him a little bit after uh, Corporal Hudson. And he actually became 241. But if you actually like kind of split hairs and say the last one that died. It, it would have been, uh, in my mind, uh, you know, uh, Terry Hudson. So um, I just, you know, just some of that stuff is just not necessary and painful to point out. But, you know, so so a lot of those deaths are symbolic, you know, as the 23rd, because I, I look at it as if they never made it out of the hospital due to their wounds yeah, and died, you know. Really- gravestone that had um yeah yeah no i i I agree jeff and and it's you know this conversation has also reminded me uh there were the people who are killed and then there are people who are traumatized i mean we heard these stories of the rescue and recovery and that's something that awful process is something i hadn't given much thought to uh until this conversation um rabbi I, i thought i'd ask you uh, people may not know that you're a Vietnam veteran, and uh, you began not as a chaplain in the military. Um, how did your, I, I would imagine that that experience helped prepare you in a sense for this moment in 1983 and for your work as a chaplain? Yeah, thank you for calling on me. I had a couple of things, but let me answer your question first. Yeah, I my father was actually born in Russia and came as a three-year-old to America. He didn't have a military career, but he quit his job the day after Pearl Harbor and was in for the rest of World War II. So I was the oldest of three boys, and he just instilled in me the idea that I had to uh, continue to pay our dues as a family, that we had made it to America. And so I was in NROTC in college at Dartmouth, went straight from graduation uh, to the rivers of Vietnam. And although, you know, many terrible times, it it also taught me about character, about leadership. I I saw the difference between a a poor leader and a good leader, how it affected the whole uh, ship command. Uh, But it also changed my life in terms of the chaplaincy. there was a circuit riding uh, Christian chaplain, an Episcopal priest, Les Westling was his name. He died a few years ago. You know, none of us in the rivers had enough 
personnel to merit our own chaplain. So he circuit rode. And uh, when he got to my ship after I had uh, reported on board, uh, he appointed me Jewish lay leader and then eventually Jewish lay leader for the Mekong Delta. And he planted the seed in my mind that I should consider being a rabbi. So I started corresponding with the rabbinical school in New York after Vietnam. I, I switched to Naval Intelligence. I was in Europe, but I was corresponding. So uh, as soon as I, I finished my obligated service, got out, I went for an interview in rabbinical school, was accepted. And then later when I was ordained, I returned to the Navy thinking it would be one assignment. And it was, I stayed in for 25 years. So Vietnam uh, taught me a lot. And, um, but, it, but it, most of all, it taught me what a real chaplain was, someone who was deeply faithful uh, to his or, or her own faith, but that enough faith that it spilled over and could touch the spiritual journey of others of no faith, of, of other faiths, or even those with no faith, just to give them uh, them hope. So yeah, I'm proud that I served in Vietnam. I'm proud that I came back as a chaplain. I just wanted to mention a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I'm glad that uh, the uh, exhibit at the uh, National Marine of the National Museum of the Marine Corps in Quantico was mentioned. I went there today purposely because I couldn't go to Jacksonville. So I thought I would go see the new exhibit. It's a temporary exhibit, uh, but it's gonna be there for at least a year. But th the museum, as many of you may know, is being expanded right now. It only goes through Vietnam. So the new uh, expansion will include post-Vietnam, including Beirut, and the war uh, uh, on, on terror, Iraq, Afghanistan. And right now, if any of you do have the opportunity to go to the museum, you can go up the steps and look down at the still unopened expansion, but you can look down and see some of the uh, future permanent uh, Beirut uh, exhibit. The other thing I wanted to say is next year, a book is coming out that's go, uh, it's written by two authors, Jack Carr, who's very famous for a lot of fiction, intelligence, spy novels, but James Scott, a historian, Pulitzer Prize winning, winner. And the two of them are collaborating to write a book. It's called uh, 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 Now I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. forgetting exactly the title. It has but Target in it. Target. Targeted, exactly. Thank you. Targeted um, the attack that launched the war on terror. And uh, it promises to include a lot of information never before shared because Scott is working with a lot of recently declassified uh, documents and he's already shared a few of them with me. And uh, it's, it's going to be a very powerful book. And I think between the museum and the book and the documentaries that are being made now, uh, you know, there are two, there's Michael Ivey's and then there's a man named Robert Mack who's uh, making a separate film documentary. Uh, you know, maybe it took 40 years, but maybe we'll really start uh, doing a better job in terms of remembering. Especially now that we do see connections between this event that happened 40 years ago and what's happening today and what has yes. happened over the past several decades. Sometimes it does take that time to get a perspective yes. on the significance of the event. Thank yes. you so much. I want to I want to uh, encourage people to take our survey. We have a survey monkey survey for for uh, our Veterans Breakfast Club programs. We encourage people to take two and a half minutes, answer our questions. What do you like about this program? What could we improve? Uh, you know, and, and then we also invite people just to make recommendations for other programs about other subjects. It's uh, It helps us enormously with planning our programming and improving our programming. I put the uh, I put the link to our survey, Monkey Survey, here in the chat. Uh, I love Ron Gianta saying chaplains, and this is just direct to me, but sorry, Ron, I think I'm going to read it to everybody. Chaplains are the unsung heroes of the U.S. military, and they have been there for every conflict. And I'm very absolutely struck by this the descriptions 
of how those chaplains, including you, Rabbi, uh, worked that day, that 40 years ago today, uh, selflessly, fearlessly, fearlessly. Um, and, it, you know, under the most difficult circumstances, I, I just, um, it, it, it's striking that, uh, that, that your service still means so much to so many after so many years. Um, Brad, do you have any kind of, uh, words here at, toward, as we near the end of this program? Well, we just have a few minutes left and I have to thank everybody for joining us tonight. You know, the rabbi gave us such inspiring words 40 years ago and also today about hope and carrying on the memories. And I'm so proud that, that we tonight have stopped and from our routines and paid, paid honor and to those that have sacrificed and served so bravely and probably unknown to so many. I ask people about Beirut 1983 and some of them don't know and I take the time to tell them about it. And, you know, we're losing some veterans, of course, as we get 40 years along here. But for those Beirut veterans that came on tonight to tell their stories, it's very difficult, even though it's 40 years for them to talk about it. And for them to share it with us is a special gift that we should really appreciate and uh, be honored that they have done that. And I would like to uh, give time to Colonel Gerlach to uh, close out the program, sir. And uh, we owe so much to you and your leadership and what you've done for our nation through countless days, years, and conflicts. So if you would, wouldn't mind, sir, would you close the program out for us on our Beirut Memorial? I thank you for this opportunity to, get, to be together, to remember all those who served in Beirut and uh, keep the faith. Will do. Keep the faith. Those are wonderful words. I'm very impressed. I'm just, you know, I, I marked here on a, my uh, clipboard that we had about 100 viewers at one point on this program, both both on Facebook, on YouTube, and the Zoom room here. And that's a wonderful thing for, you know, 100 people to stop by our little tiny veterans organization and have this conversation. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I hope to see some of you maybe Thursday night at 7 p.m. We'll be doing our lecture and conversation about the history of Vietnam and Vietnam War. And of course, next week, we'll do, be doing Able Archer 83, another 40th anniversary of the nuclear war scare. Thank you all for joining us. Brad Washabaugh, Colonel, thank you for the weeks and of effort and time that you put in to organizing these programs. Uh, very important work. I'm very grateful to you, Brad. Thank you. Chuck Dalahy was equally important and helpful too. Chuck, thank you very much, sir. You're welcome, Brad. Good night, everybody. Take care.